So mm -hmm. thank you, thank you for coming here. Um, now in this session we talk about Brazil, the Smithal Spice, and a software, an open source software for the management tool. Um, and first, who are we? Um, Luigi. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. My name is uh, Luigi Pellecchia. I'm a principal software quality engineer at Red Hat, and I'm working on uh, Rivals, that is our distribution for automotive. And myself, I'm Gabriele Valoni. I'm a senior principal engineer at Red Hat, <laughs> and I'm also the, the chairman of the governing board of the ELISA project. Okay, so we have 20 minutes straight because there is another back-to-back -back session and quite some material to go over. So let's get started. We talk about uh, the challenges in managing quality in open source software. Then we talk about the capability of, uh, the traceability capability of Bazel, and we'll see some automation example. So what are the challenges in managing quality in open source software? And first of all, what, what is software quality? So according to the, to the link that I placed at the bottom of this slide, uh, software quality refers to the degree to which software conforms to its requirement and meets the needs of its users. And it is formally defined as the capability of a software product to satisfy stated and implied needs when used under specified conditions. Okay, so it seems, you know, pretty easy uh, to understand. But, you know, at the end of the day, so what are, you know, what, what are these key principles? So the first one, so if you look at the same definition, so the degree to which software conforms to its requirement, what does it mean? First of all, it means that we need to have some sort of requirements that must be uh, specified and maintained. And also, it must be possible to assess the verification measure against such requirements, okay? In the second part, you know, the, the degree to which software meets the needs of its users. It, it, it means that if there is an integrator, such, inte such an integrator must be able to assess the software requirements against their context and also the degree of verification. So for example, if there is an automotive vendor that wants to integrate Linux, it must be able to assess if the Linux requirements are compatible with his own requirements and also if the verification measures are compliant, for example, with the uh, safety integrity level that he's targeting, right? So w when it comes to functional safety, okay. And, uh, and so these are, you know, the two key principles behind software quality. And now there is a problem. There's a problem because all, most of the quality standards are uh, defined according to the software D model that I guess most of you are familiar with, and you can see it on the right. And such, you know, a development model enforces starting from requirements, then, you know, going to software architectural design, in design implementation, and then up with unit testing, integration test, validation test. However, most of open source software is not developed according to such a D model, right? Okay, so then what? The, the problem here is that, you know, if we start from the code, because usually open source software development starts from the code, if we try to reverse engineer, you know, all the V model, it's, uh, you know, it's quite, uh, it's very costly. And, you know, and, uh, and maintaining the, you know, the, the resulting set of evidence is, is quite challenging. And also, uh, today, you know, there are not standardized QMS that are, you know, really able to accommodate uh, uh, software CICD development that instead uh, 
is quite peculiar of uh, open source software. And uh, you know, and you know, most of the tools you know that are used to maintain such a set of firm evidence are designed to fit you know the the model, the a requirement based development process, and not a code driven development process. And now, how do we solve this problem, right? So, how can we have a tool that is you know code centric and is also you know able to to maintain and trace all these evidences that are required for query. We have, uh, here we are introducing Bazel. So Bazel is an open source software quality management tool and you know, it makes it easy to, you know, to manage requirement, test specification, test cases, and you, know, you can also define you know, the traceability matrix that you need uh, for, uh, you know, for, for your in, in functional safety for your safety gains. And so then, why, why Bazel? So as I said, Bazel is uh, an open source tool. It is fully integrated with Git, and indeed Git is uh, probably the most common uh, uh, configuration management tool that is used across open source software. And it, it is designed also to fit CI/CD development process by focusing on code and specification first. And we'll see more detail later, which you, uh, we will show that. And you know, so basically all the, starting from the code or, or from the specification, Basil is able you know, to trace and link uh, all the work items, you know, the, the test work items or the requirement work items so that everything can stay, <coughs> can stay in sync. And in order to share such, uh, matrix of such bill of material, um, it, it, it basically is fully compatible you know, with SPDX, uh, with SPDX format and also uh, support an HTTP API uh, interface. Okay, so basically, as I said, you know, basically you know, can provide a solution to, to this problem. And now I will leave the, the stage to, to Luigi that will give you more technical details. Thank you. So, uh, as uh, Gab Gabriele already said, uh, this is uh, a software quality management tool. So, is, is it still on? Yeah? Okay. So, it is intended to um, help, uh, help us managing uh, work items such as software requirements, test specification, test cases, uh, test results, and um, uh, to track bugs and uh, more. And uh, on doing that, uh, um, our starting point in general is a software component, no? and we have to specify a reference document to create the traceability. So we can usually create, uh, we use a reference document as a software specification or source code. Those are our main starting point in general. Once we create the, the reference document, we can start creating work items. And uh, uh, basically, is um, focused on traceability, so this is why the, the slide name is traceability first, because in the same moment that you create a work item, you also have to specify the relationship within the reference document. That can be, in that case, is a piece of source code. <coughs> and so that means that you have to specify information of the work item and specific uh, information about the mapping that in basically is uh, composed by a section of the document and an offset. We generally use a plain text document as reference. And so you can see that this is a, a normal view of the tool. On the left side, you see the reference document that is divided in sections. And for each section, you can see the uh, related work items that you can create. Now you can nest uh, wor uh, work items uh, in uh, all the way that you want. Uh, with the last release of Basil that has, uh, from the last few weeks, I uh, introduced a, a new work item that is a general purpose document that really extends the capability of this tool to create traceability. Because you can, uh, add, uh, with, with the last release, uh, you can connect uh, now all the dots. You can connect uh, the specifications, the source code, the requirements, uh, the sp test specification, test cases, test report, bugs assumption of use and uh, or everything, no? also uh, data that you use to train your AI, whatever. 
because the, um, the relationship can be specified using all the relationship defined in the STDX model because we uh, want to support STDX uh, and we generate uh, STDX file in JSON format from values. Uh, this general purpose document can be of two types, a um, generic file or a text file. If you use a text file that is really interesting in the case of uh, source code, you can specify a snippet of the document and you can, uh, and BASI will provide to you an automated validation of this link anytime that you join the, the tool. So it will check if the code changed and you will be notified if something changed that, and the mapping never exists. So traceability is uh, often not enough. We need to track all the changes to our work item. And so BASI will allow you uh, to to keep things under control because it uh, saves the history of any changes to the work item and uh, to the mapping. So you see the, uh, there is an example, the version number of each uh, component in Basil is a combination of two numbers because we have, we, we have information of the work item and information about the mapping. So you can just change something in the mapping and you will, ch will see changing the, the second number. Uh, another key concept here is that we can reuse work item across the software components because we can have high, high level uh, software requirements that we can use across uh, all uh, our projects. And, uh, but we can also fork work items you know, in case we need to diverge for some reason for a new software component. You know, we have a requirement that we use across uh, hundreds of software components that just for one we need to change something. Basically, will help you to simplify these things and uh, you keep uh, the history that this new work item has been generated by another one and uh, everything is uh, saved into the history of, of uh, the database of Basil. Uh, this is just uh, no, the user for information. Uh, it's worth it to mention that uh, Basil uh, support user management, they provide uh, support for different roles and uh, you can specify permissions, read, write, owner, permission at a software component level. That is useful in the case you want <coughs> to give access to an assessor or a certification body to your instance that uh, people can navigate your public instance and uh, no, have a look to your traceability, check your test result, uh, your requirements, everything. And um, there is also a possibility to specify read permission at software component level because Sometimes company need to restrict the access for some, uh, uh, for some project, uh, for the one, for example, you need to sign an NDA. So you can say just uh, this set of people that signed the NDA can access those information. Uh, Basil provide also a test execution framework. So the, uh, the challenge was to find a way to um, abstract the test execution. Uh, because we can uh, really connect to any uh, test suite written in any programming language because we use a, an abstraction layer that is a TMT, a test management tool developed at Red Hat that is, uh, provide also a way to provision the system under test. Um, this tool provides a lot of uh, provisioning system but Basil by default just use a container that default is Fedora and uh, connect, so you can connect to a uh, physical hardware via SSH and run your test workload on the on via SSH on the machine. It can be a virtual machine, whatever, you can connect on SSH. But this is a, a starting point, you can attach whatever, uh, uh, changing the code, you can also, because the, the code is open source, uh, we can extend these to other, uh, to other test management tools. Okay, um, another um, thing that I want to mention is that you know, sometimes uh, uh, companies prefer to use uh, software requirements in file you know, because it's simple to maintain, simple developers are uh, no, uh, confident with the Git, with the um, uh, text of file, they really can push changes easily. So it's uh, still possible to use Basil in, uh, in that scenario because uh, the, that is an example I demoed to the Zephyr project. Uh, you can have requirements in file and from that file you can create requirements in uh, Basil. You can link two documents. Anytime that you do uh, create a reference document, Basil will check changes in that document. So if the requirement file change, you will be notified that you can change the requirement in Basil, the dummy one. That can be changed also with automation. 
once you have those requirements in Basil that reflect the file, you can reuse this requirement across all the software component that you have. You can start creating traceability, you can create a mapping of test cases, uh, test result, bug, uh, whatever you want. And you can uh, keep things in, uh, in Git and still work with, uh, with Basil. So uh, we will talk about few automation examples because uh, this tool, what everything that you can do in this tool at the end is done via an HTTP API. So you can use this HTTP API to do all the same things that you do with the, the user interface. So essentially, uh, that's not really, uh, there are no limitation on uh, the use that you want to, you can do with, with that because you have access to all your work item, you can run your test, you can file bug, you, so, uh, it's just a matter of uh, oh, fun. Eh? This is an example um, that will be discussed in the next few days at Linux Plumbers. That is a talk about that. So it's a, a first analysis of uh, uh, Linux kernel syscalls that is available in the public instance of uh, uh, Basil that we have uh, under ELISA. This is the URL, you can navigate it. So essentially uh, what I did is uh, list all the syscalls and connect each syscall to, to the related man page. That allowed me to create a, a, a software component in Basil. After that, I analyzed the um, man pages with an automation because we have some pattern that we can leverage in the man pages. Now, because uh, um, input parameters, uh, uh, errors, uh, uh, return values sometimes are listed in a way that we can really automate. I extracted all those information and for, e uh, for each one I checked if we already have some tests in LTP project, Linux test project. And for the matching I, I filed a test case in Basil and I mapped <coughs> it against the man page. That is not uh, all because I also analyzed the source code and I con created a document um, in Basil that referred to the, implement to the API implementation. So you have, uh, just to have a, a quick uh, Look to an API. <coughs> so this is Basil. You have a, uh, this is the syscall uh, library inside the uh, ELISA instance. So you can access uh, whatever uh, API you want. There is a search field. And here you can see there is an initial section that is a comment that is automatically you know, uh, justified with a comment. Justification here are intended to support us in the, to reach uh, the full analysis. So we want to have everything under control. So the reference document should be under control. We need to uh, assign a justification or a work item to each section. No? That will, uh, will keep things really under control. And then the, the automated uh, analysis. So you can see the link just uh, has been broken today because yesterday was, was okay. So <laughs> this file changed. Um, and so you can see here that uh, the synopsis has been connected to uh, the implementation. So, but we are notified that the, the connection is not no longer valid. Also, I attached that other piece of the, of the source code that is relevant for this API. And then you can see that for each section, I, for the one that I was able to find in automation a match, I have a, a, a test case. And we also have an example, probably this one, where you can see uh, test result. I executed it. Uh, uh, it take probably is not that. Uh, give me a sec. This one, because the same test case has been mapped across multiple. I have to find it. Yeah. Anyway, we can run it uh, in the meantime that we, we, we talk. So it's really easy to run, to run a test. You can just assign a test run uh, OSS. You need to select a test configuration. So essentially the, your target environment, for example, I want to, to run against a Fedora container. You can specify environment variable, other variables that I want, and you can just run it. And then you uh, have to wait for the, for the result. In the meantime that we go ahead with the presentation, then we can uh, look to the result. Um, give back to the 
presentation. So that is the first uh, uh, automation example that you can initiate your instance. Other examples are um, related to things that are in uh, Git. So you can have in Git your software specification and you can, uh, uh, in your CI-CD, in GitLab CI or uh, in a GitHub Action, whatever uh, CI-CD you want to have, uh, you can uh, use uh, the information of the file that changed to understand which software component has been uh, Im uh, impacted by that, affected by that in, uh, in uh, Basil. Uh, Basil will allow you to uh, automatically fix uh, warnings, Basil name warnings when uh, there is a, uh, your mapping is against a section that uh, still exists in the document but is uh, shifted in another offset. So you can automatically fix those things, you don't need to be bored you not know, really changing things uh, all the times in the uh, manually, so we can leverage automation for the things you know, that uh, are easy to, to handle. And then yeah, an example is that you can create a report where you see your software specification that changed, you can see the requirement that has been affected <laughs> and you want to see the things reflected in the source code. So you can create your own report to, to verify easily that uh, the change to the specification has been reflected to the code, for example. Another um, example is when you have uh, your source code in a Git repository. The same way you can list uh, software component in Basil that has been affected by the changes. And then you can automatically fix the warnings as uh, for the previous case. You can list requirements and test cases inside the software component. You can rerun your test case, wait for the test result. And then you can, if uh, there is uh, some problem, you can automatically file a bug, uh, link it to Basil. And uh, because usually bugs are tracked you know, in other tools that are doing their work, but in Basil you can take a reference to that, uh, to that tool. And then you can create, for example, your own uh, report. So uh, that's all for today. There are a few, uh, two, um, the project is based on two Docker images. There is a, uh, an API, HTTP API project, and a user interface project. So to run Basil, you need to start both containers if you want to use the user interface. There are sample images in the GitHub repository, and uh, there is a documentation project, and you can also request to me a demo for your use case. I'm happy to help you in any, uh, in any way to, if you want to, to have a try. Also, if you want to just demo to your colleagues, we can set up a, a demo session uh, with no problem. Okay. Uh, we have two minutes for questions. How are you doing your, how are you showing your code coverage? Uh, for especially, partic in particular for the Linux kernel. In, uh, in Basil, you can specify a coverage, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, you can see here, for example, uh, in this example, you can see uh, there are the leaves that you see um, are um, kind of coverage value, but it's not intended to be code coverage, because is a coverage that you can specify for each um, work item. So, for example, for a document or for a requirement. The meaning here is to, to specify to the community because this is uh, intended to be um, for communities, for a group of engineers that uh, want to contribute this, to say this uh, work item is really enough or not to describe this piece of the reference document. So we, the intent here is to use uh, the coverage, the coverage that you can see in Basil is not code coverage, is um, reference document coverage. So say, I have a requirement is enough, uh, one requirement to cover everything is described in the, this piece of the specification, you can share with your uh, colleagues that uh, is enough, saying uh, we cover 100% of the, uh, the reference document with that requirement. Or you can say it's not enough and you can assign a value that uh, has some sense for uh, your project. And that is true also for test cases. You can say it's enough or it's not enough, but it's not code coverage. Okay, so you're not, okay, thank you. Uh, it's a question. Oh, pause then.
before the talk, uh, I wanted to ask, in some industry, industries, it is required to do safety and now also security risk analysis. So uh, there is a need for a workflow to support risk definition or hazards definition. Does your system support this? Uh, no. <laughs> Thank you. So I mean, you can uh, you can create your document uh, with uh, a risk uh, um, a risk assessment document, but uh, so it's just to consume your, the analysis in Basil. Let's say this risk assessment cover this software require software component. You can create this traceability, but uh, there is not aimed to help you during the process of uh, making a risk assessment. Yeah, in aerospace and automotive, the software engineers aren't even allowed to do that. It has to be done independently. So it's just handed to them. Um, my question was about the tracing uh, crash investigations. In the same way that you showed uh, with the source code how you can track w which part of code mitigates which risk. Ah, okay, it's not about yeah. the assessment per se. It's okay, about yeah, uh, can, tracking uh, mitigations. Uh, absolutely, yeah. You can have your specification and your... Uh, risk assessment, you can specify how this uh, yeah, piece of risk assessment mitigate. Yeah, you can reuse the coverage uh, meaning in, uh, in Basil uh, to specify uh, how you reduce your risk. Uh, yeah, it, the, the value of that percentage can be the value that you want, essentially. You can also, I mean... Does it work? Yes. So, no, you can also um, map for example, the man page to an assumption or use a part of the man page, right? So how do you meet this, you know, uh, specification? So maybe either you verify it with a test or if you have an external mitigation, you can, you know, you can write assumption use X, Y, Z and you want to, for example. Uh, I think we have uh, more, more time because there is a, any, another talk, but uh, anyone that is interested, uh, uh, you can find me close to the Red Dot. Uh, uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Today and uh, yeah, all the week. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ci va attaccare questo, così puoi controllare il. Non ho molta intenzione di muovermi da qui. Scusa, c'è il microfono. C'è il microfono. Hello, thanks for your question. And we have another question. Yeah. Uh, Do you want to ask like Every time I write about new open source, I get about this open source in Google. Mm. Yeah, yeah, sure. meantime that uh, is preparing thank you to everyone for uh, attending uh, today's session here we have some uh, stickers if you want you can take thank you works, I can believe it, and yes, let's start it over.
So, hello everyone, and welcome, thank you for coming. I'm Alessandro Carminati, uh, a kernel engineer at Red Hat. Uh, through my career, I have the possibility to, to take various roles. Probably it's not worth annoying you speaking about my biography. So, but probably it's worth mentioning that I am working as a kernel engineer uh, focusing on the Red Hat Automotive Initiative. In this role of safety, con safety concepts are a key, um, key focus, which is what led me to join the ELISA community. I'm part of the ELISA steering committee and also uh, host a bi-weekly Linux feature working group. Today, I'll be sharing a project that I've been contributing in ELISA that stems from some earlier work in the functional safety from Red Hat. But first, let me introduce my co-presenter, Gabriele Paoloni, that I'm handed over to him. Yeah, uh, it's always myself and <laughs> same guy as before. Um, so for the people that you know, were not present at the previous session, I'm a senior principal engineer at Red Hat, chairman of the governing board of the ELISA project. And uh, yeah, and that's pretty much it. So um, yeah, so in this session, we'll look at, you know, what is uh, case not what can it do, why it is needed, and you know, how does it work? So let's move on since we are very very, you know, we are very tight. So, so KS9 is a tool that is able to reverse engineer the kernel binary, binary image to uh, provide uh, a static view of the code and of its interaction. Um, especially, it is able to visualize uh, such interaction between subsystem and drivers that are supporting uh, the implementation of uh, an API of the you know, user choice. And also it is able to uh, highlight global and static data accessed by the implementation of such of a chosen API. And if needed, is also able to provide a fine grain view of the core tree at the functional level. So in case you need to, you know, really heavily debug uh, a feature for, for any reason, okay. And, uh, you know, why it is needed? Now, if you look at the, uh, documentation that is currently available in the Linux kernel, um, there is not uh, any documentation about, uh, you know, the interaction between different subsystems. Like, so we are, you, you can see like in the kernel documentation, you have the description of uh, functionalities of different subsystems. You can look at the kernel doc headers to understand the single function behavior. However, you don't have, you know, really a view of what are, you know, the subsystems that are supporting, for example, uh, the IOCTL score to give you an example, right? So um, with KSNAV, you know, we are able, you know, to, to reverse engineer a specific binary image and, and provide, uh, to provide such a view. And, and now, why, why, why do we need such a view? Right, and because, you know, sometimes, you know, when you do, for example, a safety analysis, you need to understand what are, you know, the, the main subsystems and the key functionalities that are provided by them in the context of a specific function that you are analyzing. Also, when you write test cases and you want to, you know, to write down a meaningful VMV plan, you may want to exercise more heavily such functionalities that, you know, are more critical for, you know, for, for the end goal. And uh, another, uh, another uh, reason could be in the context of uh, a CICD continuous development, if, the, you know, the kernel is uh, a continuously evolving beast, right? And now if there is a given patch set, how can I assess, you know, what is the impact of, of such a patch set on, in the context of a specific uh, functionality. Maybe, you know, in a previous version of the kernel, uh, there was a subsystem that was involved uh, 
in, in, a, in, in, in the implementation of a, of a specific API and in a late, after a certain patch set, such subsystem is gone for some reason, right? And uh, so one option to, to solve this problem is, you know, like, you know, go ahead, read the code, understand the code through all the path, right? And uh, well, uh, yeah, it's a possibility. Uh, good luck. Um, <laughs> So, but you know, can, can we make it easier? So at the end, maybe you, need, you still need to read the code sometime, but maybe if you are able to be driven to the most critical code, uh, it could be, you know, a speed up. Uh, yeah, we can move on. How does it work? So as you know, if you don't know, now you know, the, the, all the source code of the Linux kernel it div is divided into uh, subsystems and drivers. And the maintainers, maintainers file specify such division. Now, here on the right, you can see the first three drivers, these are drivers, that you can find you know, in the, in, on the top of the maintainer file. And, and basically, you know, you can see that here, you know, it is clearly specified w what is the path, the source code path that belongs to this driver. This is the mailing list that you need to send patch to, the maintainer, uh, the status, this is supported. Okay, and this is also the website. But, um, you know, to some extent, uh, the, the source code is already partitioned in components, and these components are drivers and subsystem, and this is very important because this maintainer's file is able to tell us what is maybe an appropriate granularity to, to analyze the, the kernel code, okay. Um, let's move on. Um, um, it's uh, down to you now, yeah. ah, yes, sorry. I, uh, <coughs> keep it. So, we were saying that how does it work is a more elaborate uh, question to solve. Even though one of the functionality of KSNAV is to provide diagrams that rely or give information about subsystem. So another thing we need to comply before moving on is to define what a uh, um, subsystem is. And as Gabriele were saying, the subsystem is not something that is given in the ar kernel architecture. In, but community is agree that a subsystem is what is maintained by a single per person inside the maintainer's file. So one thing that we do is take this maintainer's file and use it as a source of information on how a subsystem is made. One thing that is important, important to see in this thing is that um, subsystem as the um, maintainer's file define them is something that is not very precise and you may end up sometimes to have a subsystem that share a file because this uh, partitioning of the code define a subsystem as a set of files. <laughs> And you can have that the set of file of two or more subsystems may have an inter intersection that is not null. So you may have some file that belong to more than one subsystem. And sometimes, if you are particularly lucky, you may also find yourself in having a, a subsystem that is completely nested into another. Uh, sorry. So in this picture here, you can see the subsystem as uh, they appear in the maintainer file. You can see nodes in this graph and also uh, arcs. Nodes uh, correspond to subsystem. Ideally, you will have a constellation of subsystem and no arcs. Unfortunately, this is not true and the arc you see are, mm, are, there is an arc between two nodes when you have an intersection, non-null intersection between two subsystems. A thing that is particularly interesting to see is the Unix 
philosophy here because you can see clearly that the everything is a file unix philosophy is well um, is well represented here by the dfs virtual file system subsystem which is the center of uh, a fairly mm, big uh, constellation of uh, nodes so time to see uh, how Kies nav work, and we will do this by examining its architecture, as shown here. The picture uh, here shows the architecture of the, the Kies nav and some of these software in, uh, in, in dependencies. The first thing you see is the kernel bin db that in the, uh, the in the diagram is represented as collector. There is the part of Kies nav that is uh, responsible to fetch information from um, a kernel image. It uses some dependencies to do this. For example, it uses radar2 to, to, to fetch the cross-references in the binary, and then use the uh, binutils to, to fetch mm, the bug information. Uh, the next thing that is in the diagram is the nav component. The nav component, oh, I forget a thing. The collector is also responsible of uh, organizing this information. This information are organized, for, as for now, inside a relational database. And uh, moving on, the nav component is the component that is responsible for using the database information to create diagrams. Then you have also a um, front-end UX, that is uh, nav web, which is another component that wraps the nav component and provides an interface, a web interface to interact with diagram produced. Sorry. Now, by now, you, um, you may be wondering why analyze the binary when we have the source code right there. It's a fair question, and I don't take it lightly. Uh, the thing is that analyzing the kernel source code has a lot of challenges. First, the kernel source code is packed with C macros that depends on build time configuration. Then you have a build process that controlled by make file, which can modify or include different files. Uh, compilers adds also other uh, problem in this because they can change the, uh, the code. And do not forget that the kernel is not made by only C, but there is also a fair part that is made in assembly, which control the interrupt and the boot sequence mostly. Um, this is some. This is uh, the pro, the, the cons of uh, having an analysis based on uh, the source code. On the other end, you have the binary image that is mostly the same that you see when you use um, what you see, what you get editor because binary is exactly what it was going to, to, to run. So you wouldn't, wouldn't have any uh, surprise or anything that is not as expected, for example, because uh, compiler optimization or because you didn't expect the, the code that goes in that way. Please note that this is particularly inter interesting in the safety concept because on effectively, what we are interesting is what we are going to run, not what the programmers intend to run. So if the compilers make change and the actual, the actual code that run is different, you may have problem when you, uh, when you talk about the, the safety. That's my part. So and uh, so and here we are showing for ex an example of how it can support a safety analysis. 
you can see here we are analyzing uh, the IOCTL syscall and because as I said the KSNAV is able to provide you a static view a static view in the context of a specific API or under analysis so here the API under analysis IOCTL it belongs to the file system VFS and infrastructure subsystem and here you can see that you we have all the interaction with the other subsystem and here you can see basically what, what are the function calls and this is the source code that where this call is made okay so even if KSNAV work at the binary level using the debug information is able you know to point you to the right of the source code and here we have you know the different subsystem indirect here it is where basically there is a, an indirect call that for a yachtel, uh, for example, usually it goes down to the uh, unlocked IOCTL callback that hooks into the specific driver that you know, was uh, specified by the um, file descriptor. So now, based from this view, you, know, you are able indeed to understand what are the subsystems involved in this context, uh, what are the function calls, and therefore, maybe your analysis could be uh, faster. You know, if you, if you either, I mean, if you want to understand the code, or if you're doing a safety analysis and understand what are the most critical functionalities, you know, in the context of the requirement that is allocated to your IOCT. Okay. Um, next one. Also, KSNAV is able to highlight uh, the global data, static and global data here, the orange circles, that are, is used by a target function, that is this one. And basically, basically this diagram it says, hey, this function is touching this global data, static and global data, but, and we have other functions here that are also accessing this data. And this is indeed, you know, uh, very important because it is able to highlight what are the uh, software resources that usually are identified with, you know, uh, static and global data, and also what are the, you know, the other uh, neighbors, if you like, that can either interfere or that are using the same resources. And this is also important, you know, to, you know, to, to drive your VMV campaign and also to complete, uh, you know, your, your safety um, analysis. Um, next slide. This is now the demo. Uh, demo time. Uh, we are already out of time, but uh, I hope nobody is going to take your sandwiches. No audio. Does it show up the no. Which is even better. Oh, okay. But we have no audio. Um. Okay. I try to comment it. So here we have uh, it is running. Is it running? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. Okay. It is. So we have the command line for the KS nav. Here there is uh, um, the first kind of uh, graph that we can produce. It is a function trace graph. And you may see uh, various color. Red color means that uh, there you reached uh, a point that is not expanded by policy. And the orange one um, is some symbols that are for various reasons uh, denied to, to expand. We are now we will see another type of diagram. This diagram here is for uh, subsystems. So you 
you have specified a target function which is the USFCD device init and this is the graph here you can see the home uh, the home um, for the target function which is the universal file storage and the all the subsystems that are attached uh, running that specific uh, function the rest is one of the subsystem as specified in the maintainer's file in any case and uh, we have four type of diagrams now we see another type of grand diagram that is the one that Gabriele used just before this diagram here is meant to provide interface from a subsystem to another where on each arc is specified the transition from one subsystem to another and lastly there is the last um, the last diagram that we see all, uh, already too there is the global data sharing uh, um, diagram this one here here you specify the function where you start and you see the orange ellipses that are the global data and the green uh, function that are function that use the same uh, global data and this terminate the video last thing we have here if my yeah I would gladly if only I could Thank you for your patience. You okay. so we finally can go to the next slide that are the new uh, feature that I plan to add to this tool this tool here you can see the um, QR code that is the uh, git repository in the Elisa namespace if you want to contribute it and uh, the next feature I want to build upon this is the capacity of the, um, the tool to operate with git repository basically you now need to provide it a build image of the kernel in the next version when it will be uh, available you will have to provide just a configuration and a git um, a kernel tree it would build its kernel and analyze that and the capacity the capacity of automate the build this because in this way you can um, you can check two, ver two different versions of the kernel and highlight the difference between a version and another this is particularly important when you want to evaluate the impact that a patch set will have on a new kernel and another thing that needs to be uh, added is the capacity of res resolve the indirect code now the indirect calls are a little bit tricky normally it is nothing it is not a thing that you can resolve in static analysis but the kernel is somehow different because you have all the code in the repository you cannot have an indirect call to a third party code or at least it is out of the scope of this investigation so in this particular case you may you may be able to take an indirect call and give a, um, um, a set of possibility of which this that indirect call can be resolved you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have a point you wouldn't have a particular uh, 
farm find from there, you will have a set you can call from here, you can go there, there and there, but it is something that is, however, useful. Then, another thing that I want to build uh, up on this is to improve the uh, current web interface and have the possibility of integrate the code browsing if you ever used the, the bootlin uh, kernel, uh, kernel browse, something like that, but plus the cross-references thing, I would like to add also the diagrams on the part that could be useful, for example, when you see the call tree uh, thing. And uh, last but not least, the collector uh, the co in the kernel DB thing, I would like to add a um, database, uh, a graph database in the set. As, so, as told in, during the, in the presentation, for now we have just um, a relational database. The objective is to take all this data, cross-references, uh, names, symbols, etc., and put into a relation, into a graph database that would enable third party uh, investigation over this data. So, I think we reached the point. If you want to contribute, there is the link and there is everything I have for this session. If any question, I would be glad to answer them. I, I think everyone can hear me, so uh, it's recorded. Uh, do you think that maintainers is a reliable source of information? Because that there are many drivers, many things that are not in that in that file. They are not documented there. Is is it enough what you get from the maintainer file? Well, if you if you are talking about the um, BSP driver that came from a different uh, tree, in this moment I don't. Uh, uh, it doesn't have this feature because the maintainer file. Usually, DSP doesn't um, update the maintainer file. However, if by chance the vendor is so kind to provide a maintainer file update with its own bits, it is able to grasp it. To grasp it I, 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 th I think the question is with respect to the, to the tree, to the mainline tree. Yeah. Uh, you're asking if yeah, exactly, all sorry. the drivers today are yeah. mapped. Yeah, in the, you the show an example spot. with the three drivers, right, right at the beginning. But most of the drivers are not most. Of, many of them are not documented there. So just a few are no. documented in the maintainer. Uh, in, the, in the maintainer's file, uh, there, pretty much all of them are. are not, not all. No, there are many which are still not documented there. Drivers, there are many. That are that are not uh, not in the maintainer's file. There are many. Yeah, for sure. You sure? Yeah, definitely, 100%. That not, they are not in the maintainer file. I can show you some now. Okay. Okay, yeah. This is something yeah. we need to investigate. Yeah, I guess they are maybe all drivers, but they are not all documented. Okay. The assumption was that the, ma the maintainer file has every... Because in the end, you have the rest in the maintainer that there yes, is it falls a back. big... It falls back to a maintainer. Yeah. Right? So, formally speaking, they are all covered because there is this, the rest that is fall back for everything else. So, mm -hmm. in this case, there are some drivers, I didn't know this, that some drivers were there. In any case, I will repeat my investigation and take more attention on this. But in any case, in, in the case, in, in the... In the scenario where a file is not, uh, a driver does uh, have not a specific uh, subsystem, it will go in the rest and you have this that is probably not ideal. But, uh, but, but if you can come up with an example, like, please send it on, I mean, it would be really interesting. I think we are out of time. <laughs> For, uh, maybe. And something which is not a question, maybe a suggestion, because I'm doing a lot of kernel crash analysis, uh, which are based on backtraces. It would be nice if you have a feature where you can specify a call tree. Uh, 
the, the exact uh, backtrace during a crash. And you are able to see all the data accessed by the functions, as you show in your example, but for a specific call chain. Because the crash is usually caused by something in the current call chain which wasn't right. It may not be exactly in the current function, but it is very often uh, located in the backtrace. That would visually simplify the process a lot. Okay. Something I can, I can work on it. So if you are so kind to submit uh, an issue for me, I take a, no, a mental note, but I'm not sure to bring it at all. In any case, just a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Any other? So thank you for your attention.